the dawn of history, humanity has sought the divine and has long recognized that people, that is people, we have made into God that which is not God. And thus we seek forgiveness and mercy. As a visible external sign of their inner thoughts of repentance, individuals have marked or adorned themselves with ashes. This is a practice that has its roots in prehistory. And some of, our, some of our oldest books of the Bible speak to this practice. The prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Jonah all speak of using ashes as signs of repentance, of one's reorientation to God. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus, angry at people not responding to the signs that the reign of God has come, he speaks of ashes and sackcloth as signs of repentance. In the context of Ash Wednesday, ashes remind us that we as humans are mortal. We all have fallen short of what God has called us to be. We are reminded that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. However, ashes, they also have a renewing and cleansing property. Traced in the sign of the cross, they remind us of our baptism and of God's love for us. They help us to remember that we are joined with God who comes to us in Christ with hope, life, love, and a new way of being. So today, like the individuals of long ago, we come knowing that we have fallen far short of God's intentions for us and are in need of redemption. We come knowing that in Christ we have been forgiven. We come knowing that we have fallen and follow in the way of Jesus in the cross. And so today may these ashes be to us a sign and an acknowledgement of our wrongdoing, of our acceptance and the forgiveness that we have in Christ. In these ashes are our prejudice, our impatience, the times we have turned our back on the suffering of others. They are in them are, is our neglect and our indifference, our materialism and greed, our hypocrisy, our envy, all of our sins. In these ashes of repentance, they are, se they are seeds of our spiritual transformation and forgiveness. For God always accepts and forgives us. Through our repentance and forgiveness comes transformation. May God create within each of us a clean heart and a new and right spirit. At this time, I invite you to now take your ashes that you have picked up at Bethlehem and remove the lid. If you are by yourself, you can take your thumb and press it into the ashes and then make the sign of the cross on your forehead, speaking these words, I am dust and to dust I shall return. If you are worshiping as a family, I would invite now one person to make the sign of the cross on each family member's forehead in the ash, using ashes, speaking these words. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. After everyone has received ashes, place the lid back on your container, wash your hand, and return to your worship space as we wait for all of our online community to complete this important action. We join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathed into dust the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. Call forth our prayers and acts of kindness and strengthen us to face our mortality with confidence in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Today's reading is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 3 through 9. Shortly after the return of Israel from exile in Babylon, the people were troubled by the ineffectiveness of their fasts. God reminds them that outward observance is no substitute for genuine fasting that results in acts of justice, such as feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, and clothing the naked. Sincere repentance will lead to a dramatic improvement of their condition. The reading begins at verse 3. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to Matthew, the sixth chapter. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus commends almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, but emphasizes that spiritual devotion must not be done for show. The reading begins at verse 16. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil in your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, Christians have been observing Lent for 1,800 years. Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, has been observed as Ash Wednesday for about a thousand years. And if you look at practices like the use of ashes, well, they go back way back before that. They can be found in pretty much all the cultures of the world. So what does it all mean? Why do we have them? And why do both Jesus and Isaiah criticize the way people are observing traditions like fasting, ashes, repentance. I'd like to speak of those things today because if we look closely what Isaiah and Jesus say, we recognize that our traditions and rituals can help us to know and love God better and they can be used to actually blind us to our own sin. And for my message this morning, I, I, you know, I, I'd like to say a few words about the Lenten traditions to try to help us live out and the danger of misusing them and the ways that they can also open up promises of God's will. 
Just a few words about Lent and the tradition. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that it took the disciples some time before they began to realize that Jesus was more than a remarkable prophet, that he was the Christ. And once they did understand that, the real hard part began. Christ's mission was not going to be one of glory, but rejection and suffering. And at first the disciples didn't even believe that, but once they came to accept it, they really never understood it. It's only after his death and resurrection that uh, they began to grasp that God's salvation through Jesus Christ is impossibly greater than anything they ever imagined. And so too was their need and our need of salvation. Our life of faith as God's people, they learned, includes difficult work of letting go all our false attachments and our mistrust of God so that we can truly open our lives to His presence and doing His will. Ash Wednesday got its name is a ritual of repentance, reminding us of that we're mortal, that life is short, that we're in God's hands, and helping us to learn what really matters in life. The ashes remind us that only God can give us eternal life. And so we join other religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity. We all have such practices of reflection, repentance, fasting, and prayer. And some of you may even give up something for Lent as a kind of fasting. Or some of you reach out to people in need in a special way as we ponder what it means to lose our life for Christ's sake. We can find these practices very helpful. And I think they are. But here come the challenges of Isaiah and Jesus to when we use religious practices falsely. Our minds are very ingenious to take religious practices and turn them into hypocrisy. Remember the last scenes of Godfather 1? Michael Corleone uses a baptism of his sister's son, his nephew, to cover for revenge. As the godfather to his sister's son, the priest asks him in the service, do you renounce the devil of all his works and all his ways? I do, he answers, and the scene cuts away to a planned assassination of an enemy the baptism of service goes on. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? I do. And again, a different murder scene. And by the end of the baptism, there's a slew of enemies that lie dead. And behind the facade of a new life in Christ at a family baptism, there is a heart, Michael Corleone's heart, that has only become hardened to the things of God. And this is where Isaiah comes in. The people of Israel are complaining that it seems as though God isn't in there, isn't there anymore, and they don't know why. They have their religious services, they do their acts of repentance, they put ashes on their face and all the things one does in a religious society of that time. We seek God, they seem to be saying, and why doesn't he reward us? Now Isaiah is a true prophet of God, and true prophets had a very important and very responsible role because a true prophet was in some way able to discern 
the words the will of God and was able to speak, therefore, God's truth. And he had an obligation to do it, too. But sometimes when you speak the truth, you don't make friends, at least of powerful people that may be benefiting by the wrong thing. But he must say it to them. Because God's truth is a matter of spiritual life and death. Here's what he says. On the day of your fasting, you do what you please and exploit your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. And then he goes on, as if speaking for God. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? A day for a man to humble himself, bowing his head like a reed and lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? Well, outwardly it is. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderers with a shelter? And when you see the naked, to clothe him and not turn away your own flesh and blood. Then you will call on the Lord and he will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. See, Israel's problem is not that they don't believe God in God and that they don't have worship and that they're not religious. They are very much so. The problem is that they live in a society that has become unjust. And in the case of this particular chapter, uh, Isaiah is zeroing in on economic injustice. So he uses words like injustice, exploitation, oppression, hunger, homelessness, the age-old problems of human society where the temptation is always for the big fish to eat the little fish. Well, that's happening also in Israel, who are supposed to be called God's people. So Isaiah says two actions are required if this repentance is going to be real. One we might call charity. Charity is where you see someone in need and you, and you, you try to provide for that need because it's urgent, they need it. Charity is in some ways easier to do because often it's looked upon very well. It's good. You get a good feeling from it. You know you want to help people. And, and you do. But charity alone does not solve the problem if there's an unjust system that is creating the problem in the first place. And that's where we move to justice. Justice is much more demanding and sometimes it's discouraging, I know. Because one person can't change the injustice of a whole system. Sometimes you just throw up your hands and say, what can I do? I'm just one person. Of course, people perhaps in greater power uh, can do something, but even they can't just change it. And yet, this scripture tells us that we're all part of a responsibility for the kind of society that we live in. And even if it takes many people who have to patiently work at it for a long time, as has been the case in this country at great times, we need to do it. We can't just say, well, you know, that's beyond what I can do. We can care about it, we can learn about it, and we can have that affect the way in which we ask for good government. Maybe the Prophet Micah can help us here. I love his short summary of what 
What does the Lord require? To love justice, to do kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. What human society does at times is to say, can't we do just one or two? And the answer is no, because they're linked. They're linked because God cares about all the people. Well, that's the criticism. But God also promises to an open heart good things. God promises to be with us in the repentances and the meditation we do, in the acts that we do to seek to grow in our faith. And the words of Jesus, which I haven't spoken of yet, uh, end in his Sermon on the Mount. I won't talk about how he too criticized false fasts, but he, he gets at the underlying problem to what happens when a society goes awry or we go awry. And it usually comes down to the fact that we are seeking the wrong things. And so he says these words that we've heard so often, but the fact of the matter is so much of our faith comes down to worshiping the right God and not worshiping things that we tend to make as gods that we attach too much importance to. And here's what he says. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. Notice, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The prayer that Jesus has for us is that we will love that which we cherish in the right way and love God above all things, and that puts things in the right order. As for Isaiah, he gives some practical suggestions. Somebody's hungry, feed them. Don't just accept the injustice that may be in your society. And he is not saying that somehow this is a payment that we're making to God so that God will listen to us. Rather, it's an effort for us to trust and obey what we know that God loves so that our hearts begin to become, begin to beat in tune with the heart of Jesus that we come to love what God loves, to delight in his will. And we should not underestimate that sometimes the rituals we do, the things that we choose to do for Lent, they can be very, very helpful in the right spirit. And finally, we come down to the, to the central insight and in that True religion is not a bunch of words or a bunch of religious practices. They can be helpful, very helpful. But true religion finally is a matter of the heart and who we give ourselves to and whose will we seek to do and whom we ask for forgiveness. And Jesus had a good test for that. He said, don't always pay attention to what's said. Know them by their fruit. You will know them by a fruit. A good tree bears good fruit. Amen.
Our service continues as we join our hearts in prayer, as we pray for the church, for the world, and for all people who have needs. Gracious God, on this Ash Wednesday, we remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. We remember our mortality. We are not God. Gracious God, continue to walk with us as we experience what it means to be human. As we live into the joys and into the sorrows of life, we pray that you would be near to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for this congregation that we might continue to discern our call, discern who we are called to be and where we are called to go in this time and place, that our message of hope, mercy, and forgiveness might be heard not just in our community, but around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for all those people who are living lives far less than you intend for your good creation. We pray for those who suffer neglect, for those who are abused, for those who lack the basic necessities of life. We pray for all those people who are sick, either in their bodies, minds, or spirits, and we lift up all those people that, who are near and dear to us in our hearts. Gracious God, grant these individuals healing even if they cannot be cured. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All this and whatever else you see that we need, we pray to you in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our service continues as we prepare to gather around the table for Holy Communion. It is important to remember that God's love and grace and mercy as received in this meal know no bounds. Our table here is expansive. It expands into your home. And so as you receive communion tonight, wherever you are worshiping, know that you do so as part of one body, one table that is expansive. And so we remember that we are not God on this Ash Wednesday. And we remember that we are human and that we will die. And so we confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, as we go about our lives, the demands, duties, and activities of our days often lead us to forget your presence and your love. We fall into sin and fail to be the people that you've called us to be. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O God. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess the pride, envy, hypocrisy, and apathy that infect our lives. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess our selfish ways and our exploitation of other people. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess our neglect of the needs and the suffering of others and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess our judgmental attitudes, our unkind thoughts toward our neighbors, and our prejudice towards those who differ from us. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Have mercy on us, O God. Restore us, O God, and forgive us, for your mercy and love are great. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the priceless grace you have bestowed upon us through Jesus Christ, who died upon the tree of Calvary and rose again to make us living branches, 
drawing our life from him and bearing fruit in all the world. Send your Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth and power to renew our faith as we receive our crucified and risen Lord who comes to us in his body and blood. And so we remember in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ is given for you. The blood of Christ is shed for you. And now, as we prepare to leave our place of worship today and take God's love out into this world, receive God's blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.